This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg, yeah, in South Africa. My name is Ian Jensen. The show, of course, always live and broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. Don't forget, we also stream live on YouTube right now. The whole show is always available on demand on our YouTube channel. Now, more than 400,000 expat South Africans have returned to the country in the last five years or so. We ask you the question today, our question of the day. How do you view expats that move back? To South Africa at SABC Newsroom. That's where you send us your contribution. Now, Doctors Without Borders are sending assistance to Europe to help refugees or help out with the refugee crisis there. They've got a press conference this morning. We'll talk to them shortly before that press conference. Then we try and answer some of the key scientific questions around uh, Homo Naledi uh, today. Later, we'll look at the Business of Design conference and we close with the Johannesburg International Comedy Festival should be a fun ending. But first, let's get the day's news from Anil Dumar. Good morning, I'm Anil Dumar. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. In Durban, more than three people have been shot dead and three injured at a shootout at the Brook Street taxi rank. Police are investigating the shooting. NetK911 initially said that six people had been killed, but police at the scene have confirmed three deaths. Acting Cape Town Mayor Brett Heron has condemned the attack on an intercape bus in Strand, in which two people died. 34 others were injured when the bus was petrol bombed last night. Western Cape Safety Minister Dan Prato has promised a full investigation into the attack. It's very bad. We don't want a thing like this to happen. It's two lives lost, two lives too many. The High Court in Pretoria is expected to hand down judgment today in the Al-Bashir saga. A decision will be made on whether to grant government leave to appeal against the court's finding that the failure to arrest Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir was unconstitutional. Meanwhile, President Jacob Zuma has said government is studying the International Criminal Court's deadline of the 4th of next month to respond to its order regarding al-Bashir. The ICC earlier ordered South Africa to explain why it didn't arrest Bashir when he was in the country in July. President Al-Bashir has been wanted since 2009 on charges of crimes against humanity. Police are on high alert in Davidson in Ikruleni. This after two teenagers were burned to death by residents yesterday afternoon. They were suspected of being part of a gang whose members killed another boy on Sunday in a fashion known as necklacing. Four of the gang members have been arrested. The Vol University of Technology will be closed for a third day today amid concerns over safety. Protests were sparked by the murders of two students last week. Meanwhile, the Student Representative Council of the University of Kuzula Natal's Westville campus say they will also not back down until their demands are met. Students there have embarked on violent protests over funding issues this week. And there seems to be no immediate relief in sight for the families of 11 suspected illegal miners whose bodies are trapped underground at the Benoni gold mine in Gauteng. The operation to retrieve their bodies was suspended as the terrain is too dangerous. It's believed the miners died in two separate incidents due to a lack of oxygen. Family and friends of the miners have threatened to bring the bodies to the surface themselves. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just simply search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Thank you very much, Anina. Uh, yesterday, the Dalai Lama said that it's impossible for all refugees to go to Europe and called for a practical response to the crisis there. Nations may soon turn to Africa for assistance now. Last week, the South African Department of Home Affairs said that the country has not yet been asked to provide help uh, during the European refugee crisis. But the Deputy International Relations Minister says we are prepared to do so. Meanwhile, South African organization Doctors Without Borders teams are playing an important role in providing aid in the European Union. At 11 o'clock this morning, MSF will be holding a press conference in Cape Town uh, to make some announcements. Joining us now 
via Skype before this conference is Doctors uh, Without Borders Humanitarian Policy Advisor Jens Pedersen. A very good morning to you, Jens. Thank you for joining us. Morning, and thanks for having me. Jens, uh, you've been assisting with the crisis in Europe. Tell us about your involvement, and, and maybe you can also tell us what the announcements will be that you're going to make this morning. Well, we've been involved in, in the crisis as it has unfolded in Europe um, for more than years now, working initially in, in reception centers in Italy, in Malta, Greece. Uh, and subsequently, we've, we've, we've scaled up and expanded our response uh, to now including uh, Search and rescues are on sea with three ships, which we are, are, are running. Uh, we are now providing medical care uh, in countries uh, from when the people arrive in Greece all the way up along the Balkans into uh, the former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, Serbia, um, and continuing operations in, in Italy as well and in reception centers in Greece. Um, I think it's important, and, and what we are trying to say is that it is a crisis, but we must keep in mind that, that this is the tip of the iceberg. The, 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 the large part of, of this crisis and, and, and uh, the real tragedy lies in where these people are fleeing from, um, such as the, the devastating war in Syria, such as conflict in Afghanistan and so forth. Now, you, you, you're talking about a demand for safe passage for people fleeing uh, the conflict and, and seeking protection within the European Union. Uh, what are some of the reports that you've been hearing about, about uh, the lack of safety, about the attacks on, on uh, refugees? And, and also, uh, how do you think safe passage could be guaranteed under the current uh, circumstances in Europe? Well, I think the lack of safety is, is inherently uh, highlighted in the fact that more than 2,700 people have died this, you know, trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea um, because they are, are forced to do so under conditions or in, in boats and, and, and ships which are not safe, they are leaky, they are forced in, 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 in overcrowded uh, uh, conditions by smugglers, for example. Um, we are seeing people having to walk long distance uh, when arriving at, at coastal areas without access to adequate medical care, without access to proper shelter. Um, so the safety is, is imperative when people are seeking protection. What is required is that once uh, people who are fleeing, they arrive, they, and, and even before they leave, as we see now in the dangers of crossing the Mediterranean, there needs to be measures put in place which make sure that these risks and these inherently very, very dangerous measures that people desperately are, are, are taking to in order to seek protection, um, they need to be addressed. Why should South Africans care about the situation in Europe? Uh, will it in turn, do you believe, affect us at some point and the continent at some point in the future? Well, it, it does affect us because uh, a large part of the, the people fleeing and, and, and seeking safety and protection in Europe are African people as well, um, fleeing from a variety of, of, of African countries. So it already affects Africans, and that's why, as South Africa, uh, we should care. Um, I think it's it's if, if we put it in the context of, of, of people, more than 60 million people being displaced across the world, I think this being the tip of the iceberg, we, we need to start thinking on how we, we can better handle as countries, as, as individuals and people, how we, how we can better help and assist people seeking protection. And as South Africans, as individuals, we need to, to think about that. We need to take a stand on, on that in order to, to avoid that, that it becomes each country uh, for themselves, as we are almost seeing in, in the European Union at the moment, where there's no coordinated, there's no concerted effort to actually ensure that people are having safe access, that people are not being forced to flee in, in, in ramshack boats, um, because each country is, is trying to keep them away from their own shores. How can South Africans get involved, and how can people on the rest of the continent get involved? 
Well, as MSF Southern Africa, we are appealing for support, uh, an expression of, of support and solidarity with, with the people fleeing. And, and uh, we, we are asking South Africans to donate to us. And you can SMS by, by sending the name JOIN or the word JOIN to 42110. Um, and, and by that way, express some, some support and solidarity, sorry, with, with the people that are fleeing. But as I said, I think it's important that we also individually uh, take a stand and saying, people that are fleeing, they, they deserve protection and, and they deserve uh, our assistance when, when they are fleeing through desperate measures from very, very desperate conditions, be it from Syria, be it from African countries, be it from Afghanistan and so forth. Yeah, and so thank you for joining us uh, this morning. That is uh, Dr. Zodat Borders, Humanitarian Policy Advisor, Jens Pedersen. They've got a, uh, they've got a press conference at 11 o'clock this morning where they're going to, uh, well, tell us a little bit more about the involvement of the organization uh, in Europe and how you can get involved. Now, as immigration specialists have recently revealed, a spike in the number of South African citizens applying for foreign citizenship there also seems to be an increase in the number of those who return to South Africa after living abroad. Now, research by Free, Mark, Free Market Foundation economist Lone Sharp has showed that more than 400,000 white expat South Africans have returned to the land of their birth since the apex of the financial crisis in 2009. Now, to talk to us a little bit more about this, well, finally we have Lone Sharp with us in studio after about a week. Nice to have you with us. Morning. It's in this case. There's a there's a, a lot of unhappiness with some of the numbers that have been yes. been, been been coming out. It's it's important to keep in mind that your research does not reflect stats essay uh, figures. I think, but you looked at figures from South Africa's largest recruitment firm, AdCorp. Mm -hmm. Just tell us how the methodology, how you came up with with these numbers. So uh, AdCorp's the biggest rec recruitment firm in the country. Uh, AdCorp places about 200,000 people into the world of work a year. Uh, we monitor and track each of those people. They are valuable candidates uh, to AdCorp. AdCorp uh, monitors their, their work uh, patterns, their work behavior, their contracts and so on. So um, this data is uh, way more reliable about the expat community than the statistics essay enumerators who go out into the community and ask survey questions. Mm. Um, many of those enumerators, uh, when they enc in, uh, uh, encounter foreign South Africans, uh, they're reluctant uh, to answer the stats essay questions. Uh, when they encounter high net worth individuals, they can't access their homes to no. ask the questions. So stats essay figures have a place yeah. Um, but in terms of tracking very high-skilled people, their employment opportunities overseas and domestically, I think we need to stick with the figures from the big recruitment firms. Gary Eisenberg, immigration lawyer, he's been quite critical of, of the work that you've done in this space. Mm -hmm. He says that your, uh, the number of returnees you, you put forward are, is troubling and misleading. Why, why, why do you think they, they have this view? Well, I mean, everybody likes to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, the, white, the working age white population peaked in 1973 at about uh, 6.5 million working age whites. That fell to 3.9 million in 2004. And then after the global recession uh, in 2007, about 450,000 of them returned. Many of them believed that their work contracts in English-speaking countries to which they had migrated, mm. that those contracts were secure. Turns out they were not. That in finance, accounting, law, and other areas where South Africans had emigrated and found jobs, mm -hmm. those jobs turned out to be highly cyclical. Uh, so those South Africans have had no choice but to, but to return to South Africa. Uh, and such a large number of them have returned that we're actually seeing wages for high-skilled South Africans mm. coming down for the first time in 20 years. So what does that tell people who often tell us uh, South Africa is a this country and a that country and, and I'm going to emigrate? What's the lesson that we should learn uh, from these numbers? The economics matter. You cannot emigrate purely on the basis of 
security concerns, political concerns, mm. etc. Uh, you've got to take into account the economic conditions that you will find overseas. Mm. We are now in the eighth consecutive year of economic stagnation in the world. And uh, as a result, uh, the economics are very important. Uh, so South Africans have high wages in South Africa, excellent living standards, lots of private services and so on. Um, I think uh, it's, it's mad for people to consider immigrating without considering the economics. Brain gain. <coughs> let's, let, let's just look at, 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 the, at the sort, what the numbers say. How do you interpret this? Does it mean we've, we've seen a substantial brain gain with people coming back or, or is it inconsequential? No, uh, it's a huge number. If you think about it at the moment, there are about 860,000 vacancies in the private sector. These are jobs that could be filled immediately if only the skills and experience were available. Uh, so South Africans returning, uh, they're returning to very good conditions. Uh, the wages they earn are internationally competitive. The lifestyles they have mm. are internationally competitive. Uh, the, the main troubling factor <coughs> is that we're not <coughs> introducing sufficient numbers of high-skilled people out of the education system. <coughs> Engineering, mining, I'm just checking in, construction sectors are, they're the ones who always hunt for, for expat South Africans. Why, why is that? Well, South Africans have those skills. Uh, and here our universities are not innocent. Uh, our universities direct people into certain fields of study and lines of inquiry. They do that because the universities are in a very close relationship, almost a cartel-like relationship with the professions. So the universities admit only certain mm -hmm. numbers of people into the main professions. But those, that's where we have the skills, geology, um, accounting, mm -hmm. law, and so on. Uh, so, so that's where South Africans are typically uh, offered opportunities abroad. Those offers have disappeared. What about the unemployment rate? Is it skewed here in South Africa or is it accurate? Well, you know, Statsy says sends out questionnaires to 30,000 people a, a quarter mm -hmm. every three months. Uh, they get about 26,000 of those questionnaires back. The questionnaire asks people, did you work for an hour or more in the reference week? Now you tell me whether employment for an hour in a week qualifies as employment. Of course it doesn't. Um, so we need an overhaul at Stats SA because there's been political manipulation of the figures uh, to present a more favorable impression than really is the case. But having said that, uh, Stats SA is also blind to what's going on in the informal economy. There was pretty much no inf informal economy in 1994. And then because of adverse laws and regulations about labor, about land ownership, and so mm. on, um, the informal sector is now probably about 18% of the total workforce. Well, Lam Sharp, thank you for joining us. The numbers are interesting, and it's a, an interesting way uh, at looking at these numbers, completely different from, uh, from what well, would be accepted as normal practice. Thanks again for joining us this morning. That's Lam Sharp uh, talking about how many... Well, expats have come back to South Africa. Our question of the day, how do you view expats returning to South Africa? Some say, uh, well, they come here to make a genuine, legitimate uh, contribution to the economy. They bring rare skills and so forth. Uh, of course, other people, are not, others are not so uh, complimentary. Now, we move on. Quite a fuss was made about the apparent lack of an official homecoming ceremony for world champion Wayne van Niekerk this week. He's an impressive young man, a world champion, who shuns the limelight, actually. Fanike was welcomed back by the City of Roses yesterday. It's been a good couple of years for UFS students. From Miss World to rugby, netball and tennis champions to national serenade winners. But there was a special well done from the university today for their latest golden boy, Wade Fanike. It was these 43 seconds in Beijing that grabbed the attention of the world, a feat that the humble student says was a real team effort. And the person I am today is because of the people around me and the team that I am with. And I really think that what I've achieved is not my achievement, 
that is our achievement. Wade will enjoy some time off from running as he completes his studies, but his vision is firmly set on Rio 2016. Richard Newton, SABC News, Bloemfontein. Western Cape Police are investigating a case of murder and attempted murder after an Intercape bus, bus was set alight in the Strand with about 35 passengers on board. The bus was struck by at least three petrol bombs last night. Two people were killed and several others were injured following the incident. There you see the picture of the burnt out bus. It shocked the local community. The incident, of course, no one knows who ha who's responsible for this incident. Let's take a look at some of the views that uh, are doing the rounds on social media, of course, at SABC Newsroom is where you can interact with us. Marak David Maraki says, what would really make passers-by take petrol bombs and burn an intercape bus in Luandle in Cape Town last night? Yes, it's, it's a little bit crazy, isn't it? Heartfelt condolences and prayers go out to the victims and families of intercape bus petrol bombing in the Strand. So wrong, children on board. That time I took an intercape bus to come to Bloom, says Flower Bomb. And then it's your driver. Very sorry to hear about the attack tonight. Intercape bus. Hope the injured recovered well. Recover well. Rest in peace to the passengers that sadly passed away. Yes, we can confirm two people lost their lives in this attack. Now, today's picture of the day uh, comes from Reza. It's captioned last night, Intercape bus scene. And there you see a picture of that bus still on fire, uh, burning there in Strand. Just outside Luandle Township, uh, that's in the northern parts of the Strand, as you go towards Solaris Pass. Now let's take a quick look at the front pages from around the globe. We start in Europe, where the Times reports that President Putin vowed to step up Moscow's military assistance to President Assad of Syria, as U.S. officials said that they expected Russian warplanes to touch down at a new airbase in the embattled country within two weeks. Then in the USA. The USA Today says the death toll in a flash flood that reportedly washed away several vehicles in southern Utah has increased to 12 people. Finally, in China, the South China Morning Post says Beijing has stepped up rhetoric against independence leaning Democratic Progressive Party officials, which is tipped to beat the island's ruling mainland friendly Kuomintang in January's coming election. Take a quick look what's happening around the country. Start in Pretoria. The state is to hear the North Gauteng High Court ruling in a Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir's case. The High Court will decide whether to grant government leave to appeal against its finding that the government behaved unconstitutionally in ignoring a court order to arrest Bashir. Then in the Northern Cape, the sentencing of Rudolf Kutsir will continue in the High Court there. The formerly Kimberley-based child photographer, he pleaded guilty to five charges of rape 16 charges of sexual assault and two charges of attempted rape, as well as 22 charges of the production of child pornography. Time for us to take a break. You're watching Newsroom here on SOS News. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom. Last week Thursday, the world was introduced to Homo naledi, a new species of ancient human discovered in South Africa's Rising Star Cave. Scientists 
extracted 1,550 fossil fragments from the cave, which were then assembled into at least 15 individual skeletons, one of the most successful, uh, well, fossils uncovered. But there are still a number of important questions that experts are still awaiting answers to. Now, joining us from Cape Town to help us uh, with this is Associate Professor of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town, Rebecca Rogers Ackerman. Very good morning to you. Uh, thank you for joining us, Professor. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Homo naledi gained international attention last week after it was announced as this dramatic new species. How, how do you know that this is a new species? How do we test this? Well, usually how we figure out something as a species is through comparison. So you look at all the fossil material and compare it to other species that we know in the fossil record. And then also we kind of use guidelines from living species as well. So to try to understand um, the range of variation within a species and what species differentiate, how species are differentiated from each other. And you kind of do all those comparisons and then make a decision on whether it's a new species. Where in human evolution in the time track of, of, of our kind on this planet does this news discovery then fit in based on the facts that have been presented so far? Well, that's a bit of a tricky question. You know, it's the fact that we don't have a date doesn't allow us to place it within a timeline at this point. Um, but we can look at what it looks like and say that you know, it clearly has a lot of affiliations with, with our lineage, with the lineage Homo, that mm -hmm. includes ultimately us, um, as well as having certain aspects of its anatomy that are a little more ape-like. So very broadly, we can place it within our lineage. Um, but in terms of the, the very fine details of where it fits, I think we're going to have to wait on a date to be able to, to do that. What techniques and methods, just to technically get the technical stuff out the way, are used to date a fossil? And, 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 and how and why is this such a difficult process? Yeah, I mean, when you date a fossil, it's very context dependent. So if you are lucky enough to have a fossil that's nicely sandwiched between, you know, old volcanic sediment, you can date that fairly easily because you can date the one above it and the one below it and you have essentially a little bracket for it. Um, in a South African context where we have a lot of these early hominins in caves, we often depend on similar kinds of things, but it has to do with um, dating some of the materials that are above and below them in caves or covering them in different ways. Um, in this particular case, it's the, the fossils were just mostly lying on the surface and a little bit in, you know, in, the, in the sandy kind of layer, in the dirt layer. And so we're not able to date it by having, seeing whether it's sandwiched between something that's easily dated. We also can't date it um, using another way that's often used, which is to look at the other animals that are there and say, okay, is this an extinct animal that lived X number of years mm -hmm. ago? Because there aren't any other animals that are, that are in the cave system with it and fossilized with it. So um, in this particular case, dating has proven to be quite difficult. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not going to eventually figure it out. Now, the, the combination of, of, of features in Homo naledi has been described as, as unusual or, or unexpected. Why is that? I think something that's really important to keep in mind here is that we don't get full skeletons very often in the fossil record. So a lot of the species that, not all of them, but a lot of the species that we, we know about in human evolution will have pretty good cranial material, so pretty good material from the head, or really great teeth, um, but not usually a full skeleton. Exceptions include things like Homo erectus that we know very well, or Neanderthals that we know very well, or Lucy, a very famous specimen. Um, in this case, we have a lot of material, we have a whole skeleton, so in almost every time we get something like that, something unexpected shows up because we've based our ideas on a one little bit or one little piece mm. and we don't get the whole package. Um, the whole package is telling us that we don't sort of evolve piecemeal from an ape-like form to a human-like form as sort of one thing. Instead, we evolve in a more mosaic way. So in this case, having a more human-like foot precedes 
having a very uh, large brain. It's helped, it helps us to better understand this process. Why then this, the, the level of unhappiness that we see? Um, unhappiness how? You mean just there just kind of being disagreement out in yeah. the uh, academic community? Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't call it unhappiness exactly. I think whenever there's a big find like this, people start to like rally and try to figure out how it, how it fits into things. And so you're bound to have a bit of disagreement. Um, part of it always revolves around whether or not it's appropriate to put it directly into homo, into our you know, direct ancestral lineage, or with, whether it's more appropriately placed as a cousin for example. And so that debate is going to go on, I think, for quite a long time as people get the chance and, uh, to come see the fossils, get the opportunity to do more work on them, or um, look at some of these scans and do research on the scans that have been already put out there as open access. This, uh, the debate continues about Homo naledi, whether it's the closest finding linking our origins to that of primates. Primates, how, how true in your opinion is this? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a misleading sort of statement. It's, I wouldn't say it's the closest thing linking us to primates because, of course, we diverged from the other apes and the chimp ancestor about six million years ago. And the oldest this could possibly be is three, and it might be considerably younger than that. We don't really know. Um, so it wouldn't be the oldest link to the other apes, but certainly it is, um, like I said, both human-like mm and ape-like in some respects. So it is a link, if you will, that shows, um, it's just one more piece of evidence showing our affinities with other primates. Being in South Africa, of course, everything gets taken back to race. The key question that uh, <laughs> some people ask, ask this week is, why is Homo no lady black? What, uh, what, what do you make <laughs> of this question? You mean, you mean the reconstruction of it? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So um, you have to remember that at the humans, all humans originally would have been black, right? So humans and our ancestors evolved in Africa. And so once we lost our hair, our skin had to be dark or we would end up suffering all sorts of problems in an African context. So we tend to think of the um, ancestor of humanity as being dark-skinned. And it's only when people, of course, left Africa and started to evolve in certain groups of humans, lighter skin color, that you ended up with the variation that we see that's out there today. So, you know, we don't know what the skin of Homo naledi looked like, but it's a pretty good guess that it was, it was dark. Uh, thank you for joining us. Very interesting. Associate Professor of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town, Rebecca Rogers Ackerman. She says all human beings were black at some point. There ends the argument about why Homer and a lady came out to be black. We move on, as we always do. The Student Representative Council of the University of KwaZulu-Natal's Westport campus say they will not back down until their demands are met. Students this week embarked on violent protests, torching and damaging university property, causing the campus to be shut down. University management has taken the decision to suspend all academic programs on all of the campuses there. Now, let's take a look at what's been doing the rounds on Twitter and Facebook with regards to the violence we've seen on our campuses, especially at UKZN. Why is there a strike at UKZN and why are they burning buildings, which they will need to study from again? Uh, a very good question, Makawa. Senzo says, UK, UKZN students are possessed. Why they are burning everything? They come across. This is madness. Uh, and it's well, because their registration free has increased. So they're not happy, so they burn the whole university down. I'm pro the strike. The grievances were genuine. What I'm not for is this stupidity. We don't have enough resources. Why burn what we do have? A very sobering view there from Mamuji. Zetugambu says it's disturbing that the minister's response to the UKZN unrest is arrest them all. I hope he was misquoted by the newspaper, says Zetu. Well, Zetu, if you are burning property and if you are assaulting people, you are operating outside of the law. Okay, it says UKZN students won't even look you in the eye as they attempt to greet you 
but suddenly brave enough to fight the police, I think is what that stands for. Now let's take a look at what's happening on News and Facebook page today. The Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa, Prasa, the acting group CEO, Natikana has denied reports that the new locomotive's brakes have mechanical problems. Ay, doch. Then, President Jacob Zuma yesterday blamed European countries for the Libyan refugee countries. And International Relations Minister Maite Nkwana Mashabane says South Africa and the United States are on different continents and thus don't necessarily agree on everything, but are focusing on these areas that strengthen the relationship. For more updates, you go to our News and Facebook page, like the page. We'll send you updates all of the time in your, face in your Facebook feed. Time to take another break. You're watching News with me on SMC News. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. In Durban, at least three people have been shot dead and three injured in a shootout at the Brook Street taxi rank. Police are investigating the shooting. NetK911 initially said that six people had been shot, but police at the scene have confirmed three deaths. Acting Cape Town Mayor Brett Heron has condemned the attack on an Intercape bus in Strand, which in which two people died. 34 others were injured when the bus was petrol bombed last night. And the High Court in Pretoria is expected to hand down judgment today in the Al Bashir saga. A decision will be made on whether to grant government leave to appeal against the court's finding that the failure to arrest Sudanese President Omar al Bashir was unconstitutional. President al Bashir has been wanted since 2009 on charges of crimes against humanity. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just simply go and search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, back to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Anina. The Johannesburg International Comedy Festival will soon be the first comedy festival of its sort set to leave the city of gold laughing out loud. LOL for the new generation. It will feature a great mix of local favorites and specifically chosen international talent. You can expect to see comedians from Zimbabwe, Uganda and Malawi on stage. And the festival will also celebrate trailblazing female comedy talent live from Bromfontein here yeah, in Johannesburg. Now, here to tell us a little bit more about, uh, about the, 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 the festival, we have the organizer, Ta Takunda Bima, and a uh, well, local comedian, uh, Luiso Madinga. So, good morning, guys. Well, good morning, Morgan. Is it a little bit early for comedians to be out yeah, on? I should be sleeping. <laughs> I, really, I really should be sleeping. Well, well done. You've done, you've done. You've done well, but... Can, if I can ask you, first time ever Joburg will see a, a festival like this. Uh, yes, the, the industry is booming. Yes, we see a lot of stuff. How is this going to be a little bit different? Well, I think, first of all, um, the festival is going to be unique in the sense that, you know, as you mentioned, it's going to feature local, continental, and international talent. 
all sharing stages in various shows in various venues all over Bramfontein and Newtown. Um, and I think it's going to be unique in the sense that, you know, the we are underpinning the whole festival around the fact that there's a globalization of comedy that's happening now. You know, yeah. you've got com so, uh, African comedians like Trevor Noah and Loisa Gola traveling all over the world. Yeah. We've got talent coming in from all over the world. And I think as the world gets smaller and smaller and we're all connected, um, comedy is also starting to travel the same path. Is your first time taking part in a, in a, in a, in a sort of undertaking of this scale? I think what's happening now is there's a lot of interchange, like, uh, interchange of talent around the world. I yeah. just came back from Edinburgh uh, a few weeks back where uh, one of our local comics, Tatsun Gonzo, was killing it there. Yeah. He was getting great reviews the whole month long. And then I, I went with Takunda to S South, South Korea, Korea. <laughs> where we did oh. comedy. Uh, so Is it a bit more physical, the comedy there? Or? Different. <laughs> very different. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so different. It's yeah. very different, but uh, it's comedy now. One, yeah, one, they don't speak English. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it's always just a great experience because you see how comedy can transcend and you see how important our, our stories can be put out into the, into the world. Yeah. Uh, so to have a festival like this, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange uniting thing yeah. to hear, um, to be listening to a Ugandan comic talking about life there. Yeah. And then you're laughing because you're getting an education, but there's this common... There's this human commonality in no. every one of our stories. Do you think? Do you think that uh, South African South Africa's sense of humour is finally catching on around the world, and, and, and people kind of like the way that uh, the way that our funny men see the world? Definitely, I think there's a there's a huge pool of talent here, and the more I travel to comedy places, the more I realise our standard is really high. The just just the comedic standard is really really mm. high here, um, and some might. Uh, say you know not like Trevor is the only one but yeah. if, you, if you really watch the comics here people really love our stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, and our guys kill it I, I love our, I love our guys I, I, I think we've got a we've got some uh, we, we've got a real crop of kind of golden generation I think almost Absolutely. almost yeah. coming through now I wanted to ask you about you managed Trevor Noah at, mm. at, at, at some point uh, podium entertainment if I'm sure. if I'm not mistaken that's correct tell us about why you think our talent is now suddenly starting to be recognized and, and, and why, why our, our, our guys are doing so well? Well, I mean, and it's a, uh, to Lois's point now, I've been traveling for the sort of past three years, I've been traveling from comedy festival to comedy festival mm. and immediately identified that the standard in South Africa is high and it's something that I've been asking myself. And what I've, what I've brought it down to is that we live in a very multicultural society and, um, and there's the, the society is broken down in so many different ways, demographics, race, class, geographics. And what ends up happening is that we are dealing with so many different dynamics that our comedians have become so adaptive yeah. at dealing with different stories, different cultures, different languages. So when we travel, we're able to uh, navigate the landscape, whereas like the other comedians from other countries, yeah. it's one culture, one language, so they become very sort of yeah. siloed in the way they think. Whereas with us, Trevor is a perfect example. I mean, he, he's mixed race, he's got white family, he's got black family, yeah. he speaks five different languages. So his perspective and the world is much more colorful yeah. than the ordinary person. Also, I think, our, I think our comedians are, because of the South African element, we, we're a bit more exposed to politics and, 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 yeah. and we're a little, a little bit more open to, to speak about sex and other people and these yeah. things that, that I think sometimes even in America it's frowned, on, frowned upon a little bit. Yeah, but, um, sorry, echo what you said. It's, we're so lucky to have so many influences here in South Africa because we grew up with both our own story, but we watched American entertainment standards and we watched mm. British. So our, our influence is very global, but our story is so unique. So when we go out there and we're telling stories, when I go to South Korea and I'm talking about a rural, rural South Africa, it's a totally new story for yeah. them. It makes us so fascinating. Uh, Trevor's story is fascinating. Tats and Gonza's, like yeah. all of us have these really great stories to tell when we're on stage and it gives us, it makes us very refreshing on the comedy stage. Now, now, Tats, uh, you've been around with Tats around the world a little bit. Tell us how, how that's been received. Montreux, I think you guys mm. killed it there. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the, the components of the festival, we've got this uh, thing called Joke Nation, which is a talent search, but it's global. Yeah. And last year, Loiso and Tats and Konzo uh, went through from uh, representing South Africa um, and, com you know, were on stage against other comedians from other parts of the world. And the guys did extremely, extremely well. And from there... 
uh, Tats has been traveling in Edinburgh, Loiso has been in South Korea, and it's just been a continuation yeah. of what they've been doing. When, where can people expect Joburg uh, International Comedy Festival? What should people be looking out for? Oh, it's uh, over the weekend of the 7th? 6th to the 8th of November. 6th to the 8th, mm -hmm. to the yeah. Yeah. It's going to be so amazing. Um, and it's going to be, like you said, acts from across uh, the co different countries. Uh, across the continent. I, I, look, other, other I look forward places. to that. That's what, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm definitely going to be there, guys. Cool. Uh, it's going to be an absolute cracker, a cracking weekend, I would think. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you. Uh, the South African industry is in good hands and doing very well, not just here, but also internationally. Now, talking about comedy... Zimbabwe's parliament descended into a, a, well, a comedy set yesterday, the latest session there. I got off to a rocky start um, position. MPs claim to have received death threats, and uh, well, the 91-year-old President Robert Mugabe ended up reading the wrong speech. It was, it was chaotic. Zimbabwe's president arriving to open a new session of parliament in grand style a vintage Rolls-Royce and an occasion marked by a guard of honor, a 21-gun salute and a fly-past. But it was marred by alleged intimidation. Following state reports that several opposition members were planning to disrupt the president's address, several of them received death threats. The number does not reflect. What you have is a sender name, which sender name is just death. But what is of concern to us is that it really undermines the integrity of parliament. Act wisely by not disturbing the proceedings of the parliament. Opposition member of parliament Nelson Chamisa says it's difficult to know who could have sent the message. It's very difficult to speculate. That's why we have taken it with the parliament. Uh, we've taken it up with the speaker of parliament. We hope that investigations are going to be undertaken. Inside parliament, the president's address was meant to set the legislative agenda for the next 12 months in what insiders have described as a grave blunder. Part of the president's speech was mixed up with his previous State of the Nation address. The live broadcast of the address pulled from the airwaves. The level of compliance with good corporate governance principles at many, if not most, of our parastatal state enterprises has fallen to well below what might be regarded as even minimally acceptable. Disappointment from some members of the opposition that the president's speech did not touch on the 400 pieces of legislation that need to be realigned to the 2013 constitution. I don't know whether he was too tired um, to, to take more time, but um, yeah, it didn't go into the, some of the meaty issues that we thought we would have to go into this particular session because it's an important session um, for some of us. The presidential spokesperson is yet to return the SABC's call. Shingai Nyoka, SABC News, Harare, Zimbabwe. Yeah, chaos reigned at the official opening of the third session of oh, the, the eighth Zimbabwe parliament yesterday. During the address, just to recap, there was an apparent mix-up as President Robert Mugabe read the wrong speech and error which the main opposition quickly used to question whether Africa's oldest leader was still of sound mind. Parliament suspended live television and radio broadcasting of the speech after the MDC threatened to disrupt the event. It was an interesting day. Let's, uh, there's been lots of views around this on social media. Let's just have a look at, uh, at some of them. Dan Nolan says, I was going to do a joke about Robert Mugabe's speech, but it turned out it was a duplicate. <laughs> this is... So, Rashid Mukundo says, President Mugabe's spokesperson, G. Charamba, says the president delivered a wrong speech in his state of the nation today. Corrective measures being taken. What? He says. Melvin says, Mugabe's wrong speech does not only testify to the fact that the old man is tired, but also his whole administration, says Melvin. Zenzele says, uh, Prophet says, Jonathan is more vocal than the new. Minister of Information on Defending Mugabe's speech mixer. Where is the new minister in all of this? Yes, I'm sure there was a lot of dodging of bullets in Harare yesterday after the wrong speech was read uh, at the opening of the 8th Parliament in Zimbabwe. You have to see the funny side in this, as we have to see it, all of these things in life. Anyhow, that's where we leave it. We'll be back tomorrow. The show is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with the show available, of course, on demand 
on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning.